fellow educators, industry experts, administrators, parents that are transitioning during this very tough time of COVID. Um, look, we created this webinar because a lot of people were reaching out um, and saying, how do we engage and empower our students online when we can't see them face to face? And we understand how challenging that is. So really what we wanted to do is get educators from across the world who were having some success with engaging students in this remote space, and they were doing it through uh, project-based experience. And so uh, this is a webinar that exposes you to some of those projects and you'll hear from these educators around some tips that they've been using uh, to experience that success um, all the way from kindergarten through grade 12 and even beyond. Um, they're using the same kinds of formulas, uh, different projects obviously, but really a deep engaging question uh, that students are exploring and answer to and integrating content. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, again, it's going to expose you to five projects. At the end of the video, if you want to learn more, um, I'm going to give you some uh, ways to do that uh, in the comments, uh, sorry, the description section below. All right, so without further ado, here is the webinar from Voices of a Learning World. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining. It's great to have you here. Uh, I'm Tom Markham. I'm the founder of PBL Global and one of the members of the Voices of a Learning World, the group that's presenting the webinar today. We're really happy to have you here. About six months ago, a group of us who had been doing PBL for quite some time in various parts of the world uh, realized that there was a huge shift coming in education. And the shift was really driven by two things. First is obvious the COVID virus and the need to go to remote learning. But there was also a shift in curriculum and testing. And that shift together with the move to remote, more remote work really got us thinking that there was room for more authentic project-based learning. And that's really what the Voices Group was formed to do. We're really looking at how we can take PBL and move it into the real world and do it in a remote way in a way that really impacts kids more than we have done in the past. Now today we have several members of the Voices Group. We have Kyle Wagner from Hong Kong. We have Kelly Pfeiffer from Dubbo, New South Wales, Australia. I'm in, Los I'm in San Francisco. And we have Angie Nastavska from Eileen Schools in Los Angeles and a few others to join us. So we got a great group. We're gonna discuss a lot of different things. You have a chance to go on the chat and offer your ideas, questions, and so forth. Now, one of the things we did when we named this group is we called it Voices of a Learning World. And that is because really in this particular situation, we find ourselves, we are all first year educators. So we invite you to innovate, think fresh, and reinvent along with us. So we welcome your comments. We all can reinvent this together. So thank you, and I'll hand it over to Kyle to get started on the webinar. All right, thanks very much, Tom. Again, uh, we're trying to collect uh, voices from around the world. We got a couple of our voices that we're gonna share with you, but use this as an inspiration to think about what you can do. Um, and we wanna hear a little bit about your voices and who you are. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna launch this poll, and hopefully it's working. So we've just launched a poll to find out a little bit about where you are tuning in from, what age of students that you work with, um, in addition to what des best describes your role in education. Uh, again, we want this to be voices that are collective, not just uh, voices for educators, but hopefully we have some industry experts um, that are out there as well. Um, even some parents that are tuning in, um, because this is really a time for us all to kind of reimagine, reinvent education. Um, so we'll launch that poll and we'll keep that open up for about the next 30 seconds and then we'll share those results. <laughs> All right, so lots of results coming in. Looks like we have a big representation of middle years and secondary, some post-secondary. Keep that up for about the next 15 seconds and then we'll share that and get going. Um, just again, to some technical items as you are filling out this poll, uh, we do have a chat window uh, available. So this is where you can post any questions you have as we get going throughout the webinar. Hopefully we'll be able to answer a lot of those. Um, but if you could put those uh, questions either in the Q&A 
Um, is that the best place to put them, Angie, in the Q&A or the chat window? Um, either or, it, it's just uh, whatever we say it should be just the same place. So if we say Q&A, then let's just keep it Q&A and not use the chat. Okay, great. So chat might be confusing. Just put your questions in the Q&A section and we will address those questions as we go um, and make those very specific to your needs. Okay, I'm gonna end this poll and let's see who we have tuning in here. All right, so we had 15 votes, so not everybody voted, which is okay. <laughs> um, as you see, we have some people here from North America. Um, we've got people tuning in from Africa, one person. Uh, Asia, we got a decent representation with seven. And Australia, Oceania, we have two. Uh, a, a small contingency of early years and lots of primary year two, year five. Um, and middle years and secondary um, are about the, uh, the same in terms of representation. So as you see, we have a lot of people across the board, lots of teachers, uh, school leaders, um, and some industry experts as well. Um, so sorry if you guys weren't seeing that because I wasn't sharing the results. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you guys see that now. Sorry, I was reading the results, <laughs> which you can't see them. Can you guys see those results now? Okay. Um, Great, so here are the results, so you guys can see those. There are about 20 people who voted, uh, but about 50 to 60 people um, so far tuning into this webinar. So uh, again, we wanna share that because we want to have a little bit of something for everybody um, in this webinar. So we know that everyone is feeling a little bit different about remote learning. Uh, we asked you to chime in on the Padlet in terms of sharing how you feel about remote learning. We have all different types of feelings. Um, some people imagine what is now possible, kind of like a plant that is um, able to grow and have a, a new seed. Um, some people feel like, hey, if I got my cup of coffee, it doesn't matter what fire is going on behind me <laughs> with remote learning, I can get through it. Um, definitely, I'm the same way. I've already had my cup of coffee. Um, some people are feeling a little bit disconnected, which is totally understandable. Uh, this is a tough time. We're used to seeing kids face to face and our staff face to face. And some people might feel a little bit unprepared. So we want to honor how everybody's feeling moving into this space. We don't think that we can cover everything about being effective in this space in one webinar. And that's not the intention of this. The intention really is to spark interest um, about how we can use uh, PBL, project-based learning. Um, this is one of many strategies, but we're very passionate about using projects. And hopefully after seeing some of these presentations and hearing these stories, you will be passionate about using those as well to engage, empower, and ignite your learners. So there will be some technical aspects about how to do that in a remote environment, but most of this is to really inspire you into your stories, okay? So this is gonna be our focus. So I'm gonna give you a second to look at this visual. Um, and you might notice that each word starts with an A. And this is just a simple way of looking at what project-based learning when done well can do for our learners. Um, they can apply their learning, they can explore actively in coming up with answers, they can make adult connections, they can also get into academic rigor. So we're gonna look at some projects and how you get deep into that rigor. Cause some people might feel that projects live on the side, but they can be the core of what we do. We're gonna look at a little bit about assessment and how that works. And especially in a remote environment where it might be tough. Um, and really what we put the center of that whole wheel is authenticity, wanting things to be most authentic um, so that really we are tasking students with doing things um, that uh, are effective in the real world outside of school. Um, so that is going to be our focus and we are going to share um, some stories. So we have some panelists here that we're gonna to introduce to you who are teachers who have been successful in running projects in a remote environment. So you're gonna hear some stories of transformation, okay? And through those stories, what I'm gonna ask you to do is think about these things, okay? I have a sheet of paper here. Sometimes that might help you. If you have a notepad, maybe you write those things down, but don't let those ideas uh, leave um, before you get those things jotted down because you're gonna to want to, at the very end, 
um, have the opportunity to look at your classroom, your school, um, your situation, and see how you might apply what you've learned today. Okay, so keep that at the forefront, these six A's, as we're going through each of these stories. And without um, further ado, you're going to hear some stories of transformation. Um, our very first story is going to come from an early years educator. Um, one of those stories, um, unfortunately, the, uh, the educator couldn't join us, but we have another earlier story of somebody here to join us who has been successful um, in leading project-based experiences in a remote environment. And that um, is going to be PBL through design. And you're gonna hear a little bit from our guest, Trevitt, he'll give you a bit of his background. Um, if you're upper elementary, middle years, you're gonna hear three different stories and specifically how people are using COVID as a learning context in um, really engaging students in projects. And then you'll hear a secondary story around um, how people are using projects to really touch on authentic issues in their community. So again, with the early years, there's two stories. One of our educators is here to join us, um, and that is Trevitt. I will let Trevitt um, give a little bit of his background. We're going to skip through really quick this first project. And Trevitt is here. And Trevitt, can you unmute yourself, introduce yourself um, and your project? Yes, hello. Um, so um, I'm in Hong Kong, and uh, I split my time half and half at uh, a uh, school that is one part learning center and one part building an academy. So a lot of it's sort of a uh, independent school environment for the older kids. But then I also teach uh, hands-on STEM classes for little guys. And so working with the little guys, usually their parents send them in so that they're not having screen time. Well, the current situation obviously changes that dynamic entirely. So suddenly I was thrust into this situation, like everybody else, uh, where my students were coming to me for hands-on learning and the environment obviously was not conducive to that. And I found myself focusing on um, scaffolding the really, really direct skills. Who so advance the next slide? So you know, the, the thing is about working um, with students is that we often hide in the authority of it and the routine of it. And of course, that's not possible when you're sitting in front of a four-year-old and it's just you and the four-year-old and you've got an hour and a half to fill. And if you ever tried to fill an hour and a half in person, uh, it's even more daunting and endless uh, if you're trying to fake your way through it with a four-year-old for an hour and a half. Uh, so what I found was is that I had to adopt a, an attitude of play and it became a lot of um, a lot more fun and, and focus on the exchanges and just trying to get him to learn the routines in this new environment. Uh, next slide, please. So we did a lot of concrete learning. Um, we had note cards at home. We had Legos. They had a marker set, they had big sheets of paper, and this was the palette with which uh, I found myself working. And I found it really effective. Um, but let's let, if you can play the video, let's let uh, the experience speak for itself for a moment. Okay, I built one too. I don't have any ears, but there's my kitty. Is that okay? What do you think? Okay, so there's three different types of kitties, not bad. All right, so let's do a few more countings and then we'll do some drawing. So let's try to move a little faster. I'm gonna show you a different number and I want you to try to come up with the answer pretty quickly. Are you ready? Six. Six. Okay. How about now? Six. Yep. 
How about now? Seven. Now, what you can't see with the blur um, is uh, the absolute look of pride on his face as he looks up, as he just nails these one after another. And it's that experience of success on really basic things that built up to me being able to get him to do much more complicated things that I really wouldn't have been expected to get a four-year-old to do. But like I said, you're filling an hour and a half online. You figure it out. Uh, but um, can you move to the next slide? We, you know, with, the, with the older kids um, and you know, learning from the younger kids, uh, what I'm figuring out, uh, and this is just my personal insight for the last couple of months, is that working with the kids, sketching out how we think as we think, it's becoming more uh, than the usual guide on the side activity. We really are forced to let down uh, the usual barriers that we would kind of keep between ourselves and the kids so that we can show them how we process information. Uh, next slide, please. So things like mind maps and so on, but uh, the adjustable phone holder, and hopefully that this will make some sense through the, uh, uh, having that second camera on top of my sketchbook as I'm working things through, that's how Rue could see what I was doing with the Legos. It's how my older kids can see as I make a mind map or do my sketch noting. And if you don't have one at home, I suggest you buy like two to three of them. They're fantastic. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Cool, thank you uh, so much for Trevor for sharing that. Uh, a lot of good nuggets in there. Um, Again, uh, we have probably some questions for the early years as these panelists. I have some questions myself. Um, but again, this is for dedicated for you. Um, and I'm sure if you're an early years, years teacher, you probably have lots of questions. Um, so write those questions that you have. Uh, maybe it inspired some questions uh, along uh, Trevor's presentation. Put those into the uh, chat window. Trevor, I'm fascinated to know you mentioned scaffolding and you started with them doing that counting with the Legos and you build up. Can you talk a little bit about what they built up to after that point? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the math level of, of four-year-olds isn't always that high. And so, you know, some of it's just practicing the, the rote skills of, of computation. But when we can add skip counting so they can learn to count two, four, six, eight, three, six, nine. Um, you know, and even get more complicated, kids ask you questions about, well, why does the clock look like that? Well, mm -hmm. once you've taught them the skip counting, you can say, well, everything's by fives and everything's by twelves. And I've actually had that conversation with four to six year olds and they go, oh, I guess that makes sense. Does it have to be that complicated? Well, you know, they ask good questions. Um, but the other thing is to get back to, I ran maker spaces for a long time and getting them to build things out of those Legos, to take note cards and stack them vertically. Again, they're skip counting, counting by twos, four, six. Okay, how many stories do you have? How many cards did you use? And then they're doing these computations. They're actually fairly sophisticated and they're four, but if you have that much time, um, it's actually impressive how, to me anyway, how, how unimaginative I'd been in the past when I was face to face. So it forces some really cool compression. I'm not sure if I answered the question exactly, but uh, you know, it leads to other math activities that uh, are more complicated, but what I have to focus on so far anyway, uh, has been just keeping them engaged, you know, which is the core of PBL anyway, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, what I hear there is this active exploration. They're building into these more complicated concepts, but it's something that's very concrete for them. You know, Legos are a great way uh, to start that learning. And I'm sure people have probably had a lot of success with the earlier class. I think yeah. what I'm going to mention too now is, uh, is maybe because we don't have the other teacher with us, but I, I really do feel like her, her project also kind of alludes to this with, with active exploration. So if, if you wouldn't mind, Angie, would you be comfortable um, if uh, we go back to that presentation and you're able to kind of allude to those things um, and maybe maybe present what she presented to us? 
Sure, absolutely. Um, so Rosie is a stellar educator too, um, that she is very humble. Every time she talks about herself, she says, well, I don't know how much of uh, project-based learning we do, but um, she has actually endorsed PBL as her DNA of what she does. So for this project, they did all about me. I mean, it seems very thematic, but it's very scaffolded and very um, intentional. In the early years, what I have to mention, um, the most important thing is setting up um, real life provocations for the kids that as Trevor um, alluded, will lead to um, scaffolded skill building because a lot of the early childhood education people have the same questions. You know, during the COVID time, early years is the most important for literacy, numeracy, and building the essential skills and blocks. How do we do that remotely and online? So Trevor touched beautifully based on that. But um, this project was um, developed through weekly provocations and explorations. As you can see, week one was focusing on bodies. Week two was focusing on homes. Week three, families, four, health, and um, then feelings. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so here's week one, our bodies. Um, what the kids do, you can see, is um, Rosie set some provocations and investigations as soon as the kids came to their spaces, which you can usually, you can see um, in the slide in the window, which you can easily do at home. Um, I just want to highlight that I know that everyone in early childhood education panics because we have so many gadgets and manipulatives in our classrooms. And what do we do when the kids are at home? I need you to all know that it's even better. Kids are in their safe zone, safe space. And be creative, ask them to go on a scavenger hunt. So over here, Rosie asked them to um, draw their skeletons, draw their bodies, measure themselves. So as you can see, aside from the explorations, there is so much rigor and authenticity and engagement in this project because the kids are at home, but they're actually doing science and math and all those essential skills fall into the category of play and exploration instead of direct teaching. All right, next slide. Week two, obviously, was um, our home. So this was a design challenge. So Rosie used the design challenge cycle to teach the kids on how to form a hypothesis, um, how to try to create um, an idea of what they want to do. And, go out, find materials, and design um, their own home. So as you can see, the kids use different venues to come up with a product or respond to the question, how would it look like? And um, as you can see, it was very diverse, and the kids had an opportunity to uh, present everything. Next one. So um, week three was all about their families. Again, great homeschool connection. Do not ever forget that everything that you do either offer dinner table conversations, offer um, Skyping, Zoom in with my family where families participate in their projects or do something like this where you pose an exploration or provocation where families can uh, participate or be part of something. So as you can see, um, <clears throat> the kids uh, went through graphing, um, interviewing their families, um, using uh, family games, designing family games, uh, telling about show and tell about family photos, designing their family tree. And again, the beauty is all of them were so different. Next one. So health was very interesting because um, Rosie decided to do what's best for kids, which is take a breath, take a breather, and teach the kids how to do that for themselves, which is self-regulation, one of the hardest things in early childhood education. So um, she taught um, the health unit through yoga, washing hands experiment, cooking, healthy eating, which again, remember, including family, including um, all the home ingredients, going on scavenger hunts, creating their own list. So all these are um, necessary skills that slowly came um, also through play and exploration for Rosie and the kids. Next one. Oh, Great. there we go. <laughs> so I, I mean, one of the things that really struck me uh, that you mentioned through that is having that theme, right? All about me seemed like everything that revolving um, around that theme 
allows kind of each week for kids to be active, hands-on. One of the biggest challenges people are saying is hands-on. You know, how do I get kids more hands-on? Um, and kids really took up to this particular project. They're excited. It's all about them, right? It's all about their situation. So that's one thing that strikes me too is about using projects um, as this window in to exploring more of these deeper um, level themes. And also, um, Kyle, a lot of uh, early childhood education educators ask me throughout the coaching, how do I keep little ones engaged? And this is the answer. Mm -hmm. A lot of active exploration, get them up, get them moving for everything that you do. Uh, you want to do numeracy, ask them to get a placemate, placemat, anything around their house, a tray, a book, any flat surface. Then ask them to gather some things around to show you a number bond. And it can be anything around their house. And then on the actual video, instead of the instruction, ask kids to share how did they come up with a number bond or how do they break down numbers? How do they compile numbers? So think of anything that's hands-on, minds in, physical, moving, and do a lot of brain breaks. Teach kids how to self-regulate by pausing when they need, getting up when they need, and taking a break. But it's all in um, it, it's all in the movement. Think of how can you make all the activities and content that you have in mind play-based and um, exploration-based and inquiry-based. Nice. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned uh, is making everything, I think, a little bit more active, this active exploration and having them demonstrate those kind of concepts to you, which seems very, very important. I think that a lot of these early years kids, actually, when they come back to the classroom, um, whereas we might feel they've gone behind, they actually might have gone ahead because they've increased that level of self-regulation. They've increased their independence and, you know, they're going to be able to come back, able to work on their own. So, Thanks for sharing those insights. Again, if you have any questions, I know we have a few early educators here tuned in. In the Q&A, please write those questions. We're going to address those. Um, but if we don't see those questions, we're going to move on uh, to the next stage, which is that primary um, up to middle school level. Okay, so we'll skip through um, those. And again, write those questions in the chat window. Uh, jot down any ways that you heard that you might want to apply to your classroom. And now we're going to move on to the upper elementary middle years project. Um, and we're going to introduce to you Mike Manchelo. So Mike is one of our panelists. Mike's going to introduce himself and a project that he ran. Um, good morning, everybody, or good evening. Um, so uh, I did this project with um, a, a class a school in Beijing, um, where I was currently working, uh, YSS Beijing. And um, we decided to, uh, after a couple of months of e-learning ourselves, we decided to create a project where we would try to support other learners who were perhaps just coming into e-learning. Um, and I'm going to, to touch on applied learning and assessment practices. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we'd, we'd done about three months of e-learning ourselves um, and the teaching team I was working with, so this was a, a year seven class, um, about four to five students. Um, and there was about three teachers. So the teaching team I, just, I was working with, we decided to launch a project that looked um, at answering the following driving question. So um, how has e-learning affected us as a school, China and the wider world? So um, we were looking at their experiences and we're trying to develop some empathy in children um, to kind of give their advice and tips, top tips to other students, other children in their situation. And um, the main products from this project was the digital products. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, mainly the the digital products we were created were um, there was a Prezi. You can see the Prezi um, in the top right right hand corner, um, and you and a Canva, which is in the bottom right corner, and then um, there's also a website that a student created um, down in the bottom left corner. Um, so, yeah, there were mainly digital products, um, but obviously we tried to give as much choice, uh, voice and choice to students as possible. So if there was a, um, a physical product, it would have been a, like a handmade book 
or a, a pamphlet or some kind of poster. Um, most of the students made um, a number of different products to, to present. Um, next slide, please. So, I'm um, sorry, before you go on to the next slide, the links are there um, for you to go and take a look at if you have time. So, you can, um, I can perhaps post them on the, um, the chat. Um, is that okay, Kyle? Do you think that's okay? Um, Kyle, you're muted. Kyle, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, no, I think it's quite impactful to show a little bit of what those products look like. Um, and then, you know, we can, uh, of course, share those links later um, into it. But it's nice, nice for them to be able to see what was created. Yeah, so, um, so this is the Prezi done. Um, and if you just go back to the first page, try to um, make it quite open. And to to explore different areas. So the e-learning is it looks a little bit at uh, what e-learning is and their kind of perspectives on e-learning. And we also looked at sustainability and they kind of had a discussion around do they think sustainability will be uh, e-learning can be sustainable? How long can it go on for? Um, how long can we sustain this type of learning? Um, at schools and it, you know it came out that they do miss that contact with their teachers but they, they understood why we're doing e-learning and um, I tried to get them to look at a wider um, view so a global perspective try to um, do some research on what other schools might have been doing and um, you know try to develop that more wider perspective and um, this this is a particularly good one um, the want to know more sections is quite good with sources and additional information where um, the audience can go and find more information on that particular topic. Um, the top five tips there, there's tips for teachers and tips for students. Um, she really went quite, um, you know, quite deep into this project. Um, and the final slide is a little bit on assessment practices. Um, so next slide. I don't know if my screen's frozen. Do you see it? Does it not show any assessment practices? Ah, uh, yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it now. Um, so the main purpose of this project was to get students to reflect on their e-learning experience um, and to give students around the world a chance to give them their advice and top tips, top tips for both students and teachers. Um, and we had a little look at the advantages and disadvantages of e-learning um, and some of them created multiple projects. So this is the, the rubric that I used to um, assess them and you can see the green section is, is the, the standards that they have to reach. So um, and actually the yellow is targets that I gave them and the blue is things that I thought were exceptional. So the, the green column is based on, on school standards. So we shared the standards with the students and um, we had a discussion around the standards and they came up with this language. Um, obviously edited a little bit by the teachers, but, um, but yeah, and then this gives them a chance to self-assess so um, they would highlight the fourth column, meeting the standard, and give reasons why they, they met the standard. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so, and they, so this is a chance for them to self-reflect. would reflect on the rubric, looking at the fourth column, and highlight it and say why they've highlighted it, and why they think they've met that standard. And then, the, um, and then they would justify why they think they've gone beyond the standard or why they didn't quite need it. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Um, it's quite difficult okay. to go. Uh, Kyle, um, can you see those questions? A couple of questions coming in for Mike. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so here, here, here are questions, Mike. Um, so, you know, obviously you were doing this project in China. 
Um, and there's some people uh, yeah. here from China and they're questioning about in terms of studying online without access to, you know, things like, you know, Google yeah. or perhaps Canva without, you know, a VPN. Um, how can they, what kind of platforms do you use for students to submit? So, um, assignments? Yeah, they're, they're really good questions. So um, I should have mentioned that we used the, um, the learning management system we learned, we used the, um, was Microsoft. So we used Teams. So all our communication was on Teams, which was, um, so obviously we, don't have, we didn't have Google. Um, so we did all our work through Teams, all our communication through Teams, which um, allowed us to um, have like classroom discussions um, in the Teams conversation tab. And they were able to create groups um, to message each other. So communication and collaboration was still um, really efficient and it was really uh, quite good to see because actually um, you know implementing um, teams or, or google or um, pbl it takes time so this class i'd already been with for two years this is my second year with them so we'd really um, created some really strong practices which were immediately transferable onto the on online e-learning um, system that we, we had to go into um, Great. And in terms of, of research, um, they weren't able to Google, but we used a very, um, a very another search engine, which is called Ecosia.org. Um, and that was always our go-to for research, Ecosia.org. I can type that in there. Great. I, I think, Mike, so you, you, you've touched on some great points. Yep. Um, in terms of, you know, your platform, uh, in the tech that you use, uh, Microsoft Teams works great. Um, we're not going to go too much into those technical aspects, but I think one of the things Mike mentioned yeah. is you form those practices in terms of collaboration that you do in the classroom. And if you form those in terms of feedback structures, um, it's easy to replicate those online um, using things like uh, cl uh, Google Classroom. If you don't have access to Google Classroom using Microsoft Teams, sometimes you can use a Padlet and you can have uh, kids jam on that. Um, and then we're also going to share a few others as we get into these other secondary projects. So thanks, Mike, for the presentation. Um, Mike's being very humble. Um, I've see, I saw some of these kids' products, and they were incredible. Um, the students really took this on because they had come on to e-learning a lot sooner than those students in the West. And so they really were looking for how they can help. So in addition to being very rigorous, it was also very authentic. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so just really quickly, I'm going to put on my sharing hat. Um, we had another school that was uh, going to join us. Um, unfortunately, as we know, at the beginning of the school year, it's quite busy for teachers. And so she said we could share this project, um, but she's not able to be here. And so this was um, applied learning and adult connections. So the, the specific question really that they were looking at, Mike, I'm going to mute you just really quick. Um, so they were looking at how can we use our passions to support our communities during COVID? And that was the big question. Um, using computers, art, t-shirt design, Minecraft, or open choice. So what they did is they, they said, look, we're going to go off this timetable for our last week of school. We're going to do this grand experiment. And in fact, we're going to tell all the parents and let them know parents were apprehensive. Because, of course, you know, parents are thinking, well, what content are they going to get? How is this going to connect to what they're learning? And so they held their breath, wondering, well, how many students are going to participate? What are they going to create? And so the big question was, well, who would participate? It was optional. And they thought, you know what, if we get 10 to 15% of our students participating, we think this is going to be a big sell for this way of learning. Let's see what they can produce. So it was pretty much a grand experiment. Who would participate? So to share with you who would participate, I want to start by saying that a majority of the students actually participate. And before we get to that number, let's look at what they actually did. So in science, they looked at, well, what's currently the situation with COVID and how can we address that as scientists? They look at actually explorations of hospitals. Um, this is on mute, but that's okay. Um, 
And as you see, they're using Minecraft. And through Minecraft, they're building future hospitals that can intake more patients. They're looking specifically at the countries that were impacted by COVID. And they're looking at, well, how can we take Minecraft, something we're already passionate about, and turn this into a project? So students built out these future hospitals. They narrated over the top of it and talked about what are the different aspects they had to have. So lots of research involved, lots of applied learning in this one. Um, another thing that they did is looked at, okay, how can we combine art? How can we take art and use that to make an impact with COVID? And so with the art teacher, they put out this proposal, said, how can you use art to impact people in the community? Um, and so what they did is put together both t-shirt designs, they put together infographics, and tried to get the community to better understand COVID through art. Um, as you see here, uh, this is a very creative kind of spin on social distancing. Um, so very, very professional products in what students were producing. And keep in mind, this is a grade 10 project. These are grade six and grade seven students putting this together. So already they were blown away. Um, speaking of global connections, um, there was a, a a, a provocation that said, how can we support these current NGOs? Um, obviously, there was a lot of people um, who were left without jobs. Habitat for Humanity was already an organization that existed in Thailand. And so some students took it on to build a P PSA um, for uh, Habitat for Humanity because they didn't have one currently existing. Now, again, this happened in one week of time, folks. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, how did they do this? How did they collaborate in such a way in a digital space? And what you're going to see next, it might be a bit overwhelming, but let me just share with you um, what's involved. Um, this is a simple Trello board. And on that Trello board, if you've ever used Trello, it's a nice project management feature. Uh, each of the different topics are listed up here. And the challenges you have here, the different students that are involved in that challenge and what they did. They're sharing their work. They're sharing the different drafts of their work. There's an opportunity for the teacher to comment on their work as well and give them feedback. Um, and then finally, for them to get to that final product, final iteration, where they can share that with the adult world. And I'll just click on this one right here and see what's behind that. And if you click here, what you see behind it is this is in the back end. You see the description of the project, the big question they're answering, what they've produced, and some feedback here from the adults. So we're wondering, how do we take projects and move this into a remote environment? And what impact does it have? Well, here's the impact right here. The impact is that you're gonna get students that are gonna to collaborate together in a remote space. They're gonna produce things of professional quality. And most importantly, who's gonna participate? 86% of students participated in this challenge with an 83% completion rate. We talked about work quality and it going down during remote learning. Well, here's a way to get it up. Um, really engage students around a real topic and figure out a way to connect that to their passions. So. That's something I just briefly wanted to share. Um, if you have questions, write that in the Q&A um, box. But we're now going to turn it over and transition to Angie, who is going to share another way of how to use passions to connect students. Uh, thanks, Kyle. So um, one of the things that our amazing middle school team did at Eyelid Schools um, at Santa Clarita Valley International Charter School was that First, like everyone else, they started panicking. Um, what are we gonna do with the kids now that we transition from Friday, we are no longer in school, to Monday, we are going 100% online. So they sat together and they tried everything in week one and it seemed really hard. It was really hard for middle school kids to get their attention, to get in front of a computer, um, be engaged, uh, have their attention and also work in teams. So instead of forcing collaboration and trying to go over content and um, go over the projects that they had, they um, scrapped everything, scraped everything and they said, you know what, this is all about the kids and we call them learners. So um, we're gonna give them the autonomy for voice and choice and choose how this transition will work by telling them 
hey, here are the standards, here are the learning targets. We had this project planned. Obviously, they will not work in an online environment the way that we envision they will work for you. So help us think of the best way that we can address all this, keep you engaged and help you with the transition too. So what ended up being it, it's the the best situation ever it was voice and choice with a lot of rigor in it because it, it stemmed from the learning targets that were supposed to be covered by the end of the year and the end result was passion projects <clears throat> so i'll i'll show a few of them and i have to give credit to our <clears throat> amazing middle school facilitators, Dustin and Keith. They're incredible power duo that always do um, what's best for our kids. I have them there, Angie, on the screen. Oh, there we go. Shots. I'm so sorry. Okay, yes, we have it. So um, there's a few um, stellar projects, as you can see, the majority of the learning targets that were um, planned for the rest of the year were science-based but also literacy-based and as you can see um, there is the evolution of language obviously all about um, the science of evolution the design cycle but also literacy as well and all-time favorite to everyone when they posted on facebook everyone went nuts about it there's sense of history social studies science behind it but also literacy for the um, learner that decided to do passion project um, on um, the last meal of, of serial killers. So um, this learner went and researched above and beyond the science behind uh, serial killers. And by profiling serial killers, she created a cookbook with actual recipes and the science behind it of how to make it and what works best and um she published it so we can later on when we share resources we'll we'll put all this together and send it to you but as you can see both dustin and keith who are the facilitators of uh this eighth grade class were very apprehensive about what they're about to do and little do you know after one week they could not stop raving on social media how um, successful this is without them doing anything, just having open hours and check-ins and just making sure those benchmarks and um, explorations are set along the way with um, accountability and assessment pieces. But eventually they said, um, when you give autonomy to kids and voice and choice, here is, here is what happens. Great. And we have a question. Yeah, we, so so we had a question. Um, I guess as we're presenting, there's a lot of CAS teachers, right? Community action and service here in Hong Kong, but probably across Asia, and for that matter, maybe across the world. And they're wondering any ideas for CAS projects that work online that could be highly valuable um, if anyone has one. So I, I shared one with a uh, PSA, um, a public service announcement, which is a good way to connect um, via video. Um, on projects, but really I, I think the best way is to either have the teacher reach out to NGOs that they know or have the students directly reach out um, and start there and say, you know, during this particular time, this tough time of COVID, you know, where do you need the most support? A lot of times NGOs um, might even have something on the front page of their website as well in terms of where they're needing the most support during this time. Um, so I think this one, this was taken on the learner. So the learner reached out um, to Habitat for Humanity. I think they created the PSA knowing that there was a, a strong need and then shared that with them as, hey, is this something that you think would benefit you to put on your website? So in, any other comments, Tom? Yeah. Also remember you know, this we is asked a, this and um, IB, the IB learner profile, ask the kids, ask them to brainstorm. Um, stop thinking that, you know, we are, we have the onus of uh, learning, put them in the driver's seat and the learner profile asks for it too. So brainstorm with them too. Now that we are virtual, what can we do for CAS that would meet the requirements, but at the same time be virtual and, and you, you'll be surprised what will come up. Sorry, Tom, go ahead. Well, the, another option here is to do scenario-driven PBL by analyzing the NGO and really dissecting what they do and what their intentions are and what their different programs are 
and then develop a product almost as if they've been hired by the NGO to produce something. I think that works very well for a, a public service. I'm not frankly a real big fan of public service announcements because they're not that authentic. They get lost in the shuffle. So anything you can think about doing that would actually directly impact or speak to what the NGO mission is, I think is good. Create a product that fits into, that actually can be useful for the NGO. So scenario driven, I think is one option here. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Scenario driven, actually, you know, building that empathy of what the NGO really needs. And again, as Angie mentioned too, reaching out to those NGOs directly uh, before going too deep is a great way so that it really is most authentic. I know a lot of uh, people in San Francisco um, that were out of jobs and they were needing meals and there is a great need uh, to deliver meals um, to homes and also too when it comes to the elderly um, you know actually grocery shopping for them and there's a lot of NGOs that um, do that kind of work so that's that's where students are in the driver's seat where they're actually I guess driving <laughs> where they're actually you know have the opportunity um, to, to make an impact so so just a couple questions um, and, and answers related to that we have one more project to share and then we're going to kind of give you an opportunity for Q&A and also a chance for you to extend and think about how you're going to use the six A's in your practice um, so let's go to the last project and that's with Kelly Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Pfeiffer. I teach at a distance education school. So when COVID hit for our full-time students, it was kind of business as usual to a, a certain degree. Um, we had single course students that sign up for distance ed as well as doing their full-time face-to-face schooling as well. What I'm going to talk to you about is a project that we ran with our HSC students here at um, distance education. And so um, for HSC students here in Australia, that'd be 17, 18 year olds. So I'll go to the next slide, please, Carl. Um, one of my um, six A's is um, the importance of that adult connection, that purposeful connection. And this is a construct of one of Tom's friends, Ron Berger. And it basically is just reinforcing the level of motivation and engagement when kids feel that real sense of authenticity and to be of service in the world. You can see when they have to present to a teacher to fulfill a requirement, motivation and engagement very low, okay? When you start to amp that up by bringing in that purposeful learning, that adult connection, that real world feedback to them, the motivation and level of engagement will blow your mind. Um, and don't underestimate the power of bringing an industry expert in to your class. So if you're new to PBL or you're a bit nervous about starting, this could just be a really nice place to dip your toe into the water by thinking, okay, what is it I'm teaching these kids? Um, how can I connect that to an industry expert and bring them in to you know, launch the concept? But I always like to bring that authentic audience kick it off at the beginning of a project, bring them in in the middle for feedback, Q and A's with the kids, and then the students present to that authentic audience at the end of the project. Super powerful. Next slide, please. Our different authentic audiences we have used um, here at Dubbo Distance Education has been New South Wales government, people from Taronga Western Plains Zoo, the local council, um, Headspace, which is a well-being, social, and emotional support centre, um, and some other ideas, a centre for multicultural youth. You can see Dania there in the middle. She's from the big issue. So they're um, an NGO, which is a nice segue from what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And their whole concept is giving homeless people a hand up, not a hand out. So our focus of our project was around um, the homeless situation in New South Wales and Australia and what services are out there for um, homeless people to access and how do they know how to access them as well. And every time I've hit an authentic audience up or an industry expert, you very rarely get a no. And it's what I find fascinating is they're actually quite nervous about talking 
to the teachers and the students. So as nervous as you might be as a teacher thinking, oh, I'm bringing this person into my space, they're just as nervous. So it's, it's a nice um, relationship to evolve over time between the teachers, the students and that authentic audience. Next slide. This is a really cute text that I got from one of my students. So the students had completed the project and this was a text I received from one of my students 12 months after we'd done the project, but also they had left school. So this is a beautiful text message I got from one of my students, Grace. So I'll be quiet and let you read it. So for me, this really um, sends a huge message, message home on lifelong learning. These kids get to experience real world purposeful learning, but they can then take that experience with them and actually execute it in the real world. So for a student to still be responding to school 12 months after they left in regard to one project that we ran with them, I think is significant and just fills you with pride. And yes, sometimes you think, oh my gosh, this is hard work. It is absolutely worth it. Even though they might not see it at the time, the feelings, the experiences they get out of this, the sense of purpose um, can definitely not be lost on these students. So if anything you can take away from those six A's, it's definitely all about good project design, but the impact can be you know, lifelong. So. I'll leave it at that because I'm conscious of time. Thanks, Carl. Uh -huh. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing that. Yeah, and it's just struck by the way that these projects, you never know what's going to happen with these projects. They might stop after four or five weeks, but they'll continue on. Um, and, you know, I've seen students as old as high school that started in middle school taking on projects uh, that were very similar to the ones they did uh, in, in early years. So, um, so that's, that's pretty much the end for our project presentation in terms of really pr provoking kind of um, some ideas for you in terms of what you might do um, with your learners. And again, I'm being conscious of time as well. Um, but I, we really wanted to give you an opportunity to share any questions that you had. And more importantly, beyond just the questions, is um, what you'll dare yourself to do during remote learning. Mm -hmm. And Kelly, do you, do you want to introduce how you kind of use this, this tool? Yes, I actually um, did this with um, my staff here at Distance Ed through the Four C's Transforming School. And it's wonderful to hear all these wonderful stories, but it's a whole nother thing to actually action them. So what I would challenge everyone is to really think about what will you dare yourself to do by writing this down and making commitment to it, it really says that you know you're brave enough to take that risk okay it could be absolutely tiny it doesn't have to mean you're going to conquer the world but by actually writing it down and committing to it that you're daring yourself to take this challenge it requires bravery so kyle's got a little link to a padlet there where you can write down some possibilities of how you could action those six A's in your classroom, in your context with your cohort. Great, so in relationship to the six A's, and I just put that into the chat window. Uh, again, we want this to be voices from everyone. And we already saw some people uh, shared in the other Padlet that we sent out. Some people said they've been successful doing a virtual exhibition. That's great. You know, that's an opportunity to really make that learning applied and authentic. Um, some people also mentioned that they were working with some NGOs and they produced something. Well, that's a great opportunity to make adult connections. So really what we're asking you is just take one idea that you heard today, maybe it sparked something for yourself. And I put that Padlet there. Um, and again, we'll share this Padlet after the uh, webinar um, completes, send it later on today so you can put what you're going to do so we can have that be just really shared voices in how we're transforming um, learning through project-based learning in the remote space. Hey Kyle, so, I'll also put the Padlet in the live uh, Facebook webinar session so that the people that are watching over there can also hop on it. 
Oh, that's excellent idea. Is so is that going into the um the Facebook Live? You'll yes. you'll put that in the okay yes. in the chat. Nice. Great. So if you're tuning in uh, via Facebook Live, which a lot of people were, um, you'll get that same Padlet. Um, and use that as an inspiration board and a launching off um, pad for you. Um, so if we can really get that filled, we'll get a lot of ideas. Um, so any other questions that you have, uh, you can write those in the chat window. But again, we want to be mindful of your time because we know how precious that is, especially in these early days of school. Um, how to dive deeper. Tom, do you want to share just briefly a little bit about that page and the, the Facebook Voices of a Learning World page? Yeah, Voices of a Learning World, Facebook, please join. We will have future uh, webinars. We are planning on having a, a good 2020 and 2021 because the kinds of topics and issues that we're discussing today are not going away. They are going to probably grow. And so there's a lot of discussions to be had. And I said at the, at the beginning of the webinar, we're all reinventing together. So don't hesitate to chime in and give us your ideas because frankly, I don't think there's any experts right now in terms of how we're all doing this. So join us, please, that'd be great. Great, so thanks, that's a way, way to dive deeper. We'll send up some follow-up notes with you as well. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. We're gonna all say, say farewell for you and until next time, we see you live uh, for our next webinar. So thanks for tuning in. Thank you.